Welcome, friends. Can you hear me? Uh, we have come to a new place. So I just wanted to make sure the acoustics of this place are good and you can all hear me. As I have been saying earlier, the object of these meetings, monthly meetings, is to keep us on track on the spiritual path. Our minds being what they are, and we know how they like to run out, run out to everything that is outside of us and not stay stable inside, which is necessary for discovering our true home within. So we meet often, we meet once a month here so that we can reorient our mind and give it the kind of importance it needs, but only if it stays within and not outside. These meetings help us to go back on track and that's why we meet often. Otherwise, on the spiritual path, we do not need anything outside. Everything is inside. Everything, period. Including master, including satsang, including all discourses, including love and devotion. Everything is inside. Nothing is outside. But we don't know how to go within our own self. We are constantly looking outside for everything. And that is why when we are told to look within, we still look outside. We have no idea what it is to look within. Because we identify ourselves with this human body and because we see with these eyes of the human body, we think that is looking. And that's seeing with the human eyes. Human eyes cannot see inside. They can only see outside. So long as we think we are the human being sitting in this body, there's no way we can see inside. We'll always try to see outside. And that's the problem. If this were not so, we would not need anything outside to go to our true home within. Because all the arrangement made by the creative power itself lies within ourselves. Everything, the entire path, to our true home lies within ourselves. The ultimate creator lies within ourselves. Our true self, our soul lies within ourselves. The mechanism by which we work, the mind, the senses, they lie within ourselves. Nothing is outside. Outside what we see as a material physical world is a reflection of something working inside. Even the outside world is inside. That means there is really nothing at all outside. In reality, nothing exists outside except our own creation, which is a reflection from what is inside. So the truth is all inside. We don't have to go anywhere outside. And yet, we have to have meetings here. We have to look for a perfect living master here. We have to attend discourses. We have to meditate, meditate with the same body. We have to do all these things because we have identified ourselves with this physical body as our only self. That's the basic blunder that consciousness has committed by having an experience of being able to create an experience outside which is actually all inside. This experience we are having of a material world outside does not truly exist. It is not real. It's made up. And yet, it is the only experience we are having. So long as we believe this physical body is our self, the material world is the only reality, period. There's no other reality. You can say, well, I've had some inner visions. They are imaginary. We have had, I went on a trip, and I went out of my body and saw. Then what happened after that? I came into my body to tell you the story. It's still, everything is still outside. We are talking about outside as a reality. When we talk of out of body experience, we are still relating to something outside of this body, which we think is ourselves. That this body is me, I went outside and I came back. This whole creation of an experience of a physical world has been done because we have a physical body. Imagine for an instant, if you don't have a physical body, there's no physical world at all. Did you know that? 
if you have no physical body or if you don't identify yourself with the physical body, there's no physical world at all. The physical world is an experience generated in consciousness within ourselves and then it's being experienced outside to make it a reality of physical world. Physical reality is being created like that. We create several realities, but all realities, including the reality of our true permanent immortal home and the reality of our soul, which is immortal, is created from inside. It's amazing that we look like we are out of so many people here. We have a multitude, billions of people sitting on this planet, one planet alone. And are there billions of people making these different realities? Or is it one person making this reality? Now it looks very incongruent when I say it's only one being that's making the reality and not the billions. The billions are being created by that one person, one being. It's just like if you went to sleep and had a dream, in the dream you traveled a lot as you meet thousands of people. You meet a different, different place, you meet many people. You make friends with a lot of people. And are there really so many people dreaming at that time? Or is one only dreaming? You can never find out. Because they all look like you, they all look like they, they have interaction with you. Some of them differ from your view, some of them argue with you, some of them fight with you. They are independent people, all in the dream. When you wake up, there was only one dreamer creating all those people in single dream. That's the reality of this creation. It's a continuous dream within dream within dream within dream. That's what's happening. And yet, each dream while we're in the dream state is the reality for that period while we're in the dream. It's not reality forever. It's only a reality while we are in the dream state. While we are in the physical wakeful state right here, this is our only reality. If somebody sitting in a body, a physical body, tells me, you know, and he's telling me from a physical body, speaking from his tongue, looking out from his eyes, and he tells me, you know, this is all made up, it's unreal, he's a liar. Because he's thinking the body is real, and the rest is not. Which is totally untrue. The body is as unreal or real as the rest. Therefore, saying that I am sitting in my body, this is real, and from the, here I can say everything is unreal, is untrue. Because the body is part of the same reality or unreality that is looking out elsewhere. You cannot say that, you cannot while in a dream say that the dream body you have is the one that's creating the dream. The dream body is part of the dream. When you wake up, that was a different body, not the one that was sleeping. Then you can say it was a dream when you wake up. You cannot say during a dream, and supposing you say, supposing in a dream, and many of us I know have dreams in which we say, yeah, this is a dream, we know it. But when we say it's a dream, what do we do? We tell other people in the dream, do you know I know it's a dream? And then we wake up, there are no other people to tell. So we are still taking our being, no matter what form, whether a dream form or a physical form or any other form, we are taking that as that reality and what comes as an experience at that form is our real world. This power of consciousness is not to create illusions, it's power to create realities. How does it create reality? By using a process which looks like an illusion. A process that is dreamlike, a process that does not create any real material things, a process that is a reflection or it's a projection of something inside, how can that create reality? Very simple. It creates reality by making your own self, your own self which has no form, take on a form that fits with the reality which it creates. And then sitting in that form, everything else is according to the same form. and It is either real or everything is unreal including your form. You can't separate the two. I am emphasizing this point because I hear from people after reading books, after reading about the illusion of creation, after reading this is just a projection, they begin to think 
that in the physical body, sitting out, sitting and looking outside, we can say this is unreal. No, it's real. Why? Because the body from which you are speaking, you take it as real. You can't divide the two. It's a very big mistake. You have to function in a reality you have created. You cannot say, my body is now real, rest is unreal, and I'm going to treat the rest as unreal. A friend of mine once uh, took me for a drive in his car. We were in Hawaii, and we were on the outer ring of Hawaii, and we were driving. He said, you know, this is unreal. I can leave my hands from my steering wheel, and the car will still go on because it's all unreal thing. I said, please stop the car and let me out. <laughs> The bodies which are sitting in the car are as real or as real as the rest of the scene we are looking at. So therefore, you cannot take part of it just because you happen to be sitting in that form that that's real and the rest is unreal. If you make your form real no matter what form, everything that the form experiences becomes real. When you are a dream body, the dream becomes real. When you are a wakeful state, the wakeful body makes the wakeful world real. We create reality with this strange process that consciousness has the power of creating realities and not merely illusions. Of course, the process could be called the process by which consciousness creates reality could be called the process of illusion. But the illusion is created in such a way that a form is given to the self, which has no form. The ultimate form of the self is no form. There is absolutely no form. But we take a form, and then the form becomes our self, and then everything that comes into our experience from that form, which is as real or unreal as the form you have taken, and that becomes reality for us. I think it's the most miraculous way to create reality. If you were to tell me, can you find a better way of creating reality? I can't find one. That consciousness has this power to create several levels of realities, and with one key, that the reality will correspond with the form that the self has taken. If the self has taken the form of a fish in the water, the water and everything around the fish, including the fish, is a reality. If the form has taken the form of an astral self, the whole astral world is real. Everything else becomes unreal. If the form has taken its form as a soul, only the spiritual world without time and space is real. Everything else was made up and unreal. Now, we, we can take up several forms. That's the beauty of the power of consciousness. It's a creative power. It's the most powerful thing. We have given it so many names. If you, if you ask me what names we have given to consciousness, you might be surprised. We call it God, super God, the ultimate God, the ultimate creator. Allah, Ishwar, Parmeshwar, all names of all creators are names of consciousness. So you can imagine how powerful it is that the whole world is worshipping something which is their own consciousness. Consciousness that can create realities. Consciousness that can create worlds. Consciousness that can create everything that we want to experience. Such a powerful thing. And it exists within a form. A form of one self, a form in which only one self exists. Supposing in a dream you see a million people and you are actually sitting in a group where you go on to sleep with these hundred people, you wake up, there are only hundred real, not a million. If you wake up from the hundred and you find there are only ten people awake, there will be only ten, really. If you finally wake up, you find there was only one. Who was that one? Yourself. How would you like that? If you ultimately woke up from dream after dream, after each level of creation or reality into the ultimate form, what would you see? You find there's only one dreamer, one self, one creator, one power of consciousness, one totality of consciousness from where the whole series of dreams occur. Then people say, if that happened, now sitting here, we say, that would be terrible. We'd be so lonely. Maybe it is terrible. Maybe that's why we are sitting here. Maybe that's why we had this series of dreams to avoid that loneliness that we came here. Now that's a physical view of reality. What's the true view? The true view would be that 
we are all there. It's total. Everything that was possible to be created was there already. So we were not alone. We were total. We were much more than we, we, we ever can be here. So true view does not make us lonely when we reach the top. It makes us total. But sitting here, we say, oh, we'll be alone because there's only one self, only one dreamer. We have a tendency to evaluate any experience from the reality in which we evaluate it. We are sitting in the physical body. We are evaluating everything, including what would be our true home like. And there's no way to describe it. Can anybody possibly try to explain to me how there can be trillions and trillions of suns and moons and, tri and trillions and quadrillions and decillions of souls in a space that is zero in a dimension and time that is zero and doesn't move? Can you imagine that? Can anybody describe it? We can't describe it for the simple reason we are operating not only in a physical body, we are operating with a mind. A mind that only functions in time and space. There is no way we can conceptualize something, we can figure out something, we can visualize something that is not in time and space. This is the limitation of our own minds. And mind was merely an instrument, a cover given to us to generate an experience of time and space. Once you are in the domain of the mind, it's impossible. I normally say nothing is impossible. I can't say anything is impossible. Maybe one day you can find it. Here I say it's impossible while you are functioning with the mind and operating your consciousness with the mind, it's impossible to describe anything that is beyond the mind. As yet, mystics have tried to describe it. Mystics have tried to describe it in terms that are not only mental, they try to describe in terms that are physical. One saint says, in our true home, there are tall trees several miles high. There's no space or time, but trees are very high, miles high, laden with diamonds and rubies and other jewelry. His discourses were attended mainly by women, as you know. And they love these diamonds and jewelry. That it's worthwhile going to that place. But he's using a completely physical description, which is completely non-description of what he's talking about. But there's no way to talk about it. It's just to attract, to say something is there, an experience exists, which cannot compare with any experience here. So we use the highest exaggeration. We make stories. We tell parables. We do all kinds of things in order to explain something that cannot be explained. We try to explain with the mind, we try to understand with the mind, realizing it has a limitation. It cannot think outside of time and space. It cannot think outside of cause and effect. It cannot think that something can happen with no cause. It cannot think something can hap ha happen without an effect. These are fundamental trappings of a human mind. And so long as you operate with the mind, you can't get out of it. So that is why this whole process of creation is the greatest mystery and the greatest enchanted experience because it is experienceable. It's not explainable. It's not describable, but it's experienceable. Now that makes it a, a worthwhile goal for somebody who wants to experience something that is un unexplainable. That would be a big challenge. These perfect living masters come and give us that big challenge. They come and tell us, you can go beyond the mind and have an experience and do it while you are in this frame, in this deep dream of being a physical body. You can do it while you are here. You can do it while you still think that the physical body is your own self. You can still do that and find out. And the process they give is very simple. The process is that if consciousness is the power that creates everything and we can feel we are conscious, we know we are conscious, we know that we are thinking in our head, we know we are looking out with our eyes, we know we have a body around us, 
we know we have a world around us and all we have to do is to figure out where are these thoughts coming from where are we thinking from where are we conscious of the world around from it doesn't take very long to know that while we are in a physical human body these are all happening inside the body inside the little head of ours that doesn't take too long to figure out once you figure that out that when we think we think from there when we try to try to look out from the eyes we look out from there try to hear we hear from there when we move our hands and feet although hands and feet we move we know they are not in the head they are outside and they are below and we move around use our body from there everything we do from what is in the head what's in the brain of the physical body we know that can we then explore further what part of this brain or the head are we in not very difficult if we want to explore now this is a reversal of our normal way of looking at the world we look outside now we're going to look inside when we want to look inside we close our eyes so that we don't see outside when we close our eyes we see a darkness in front of us why do we see darkness in front of us we see darkness because we are still trying to see outside and we shut the power to see outside it's as simple as that we are not looking inside we are still looking outside if you close your eyes you won't see what is outside when you still try to look outside and we spend time closing our eyes and thinking we are looking inside how how have you started looking inside the eyes don't look inside they are the same eyes in the physical body just by closing the eyes you don't stop looking outside you can't see outside because you close your eyes if you have got your eyes open you put your hands on top you can't see if you put your lids on the eyes in front of them you can't see but you're still looking outside there's no way that you can say by closing my eyes i'm looking inside big mistake people have been closing their eyes talking with their tongue mantras chanting and saying we are finding something inside they found nothing inside ever i've never found anybody who's found anything inside how can you it's common sense that the eyes are meant to see outside you close them so you can't even see outside but you're still trying to see outside because those are the same eyes you're trying to speak with the tongue and murmuring in your mouth something sometimes not only murmuring you're carrying something beads in your hands and you're moving those beads which are outside and move them and chant words and think you're going inside how can you no way so don't fool yourself by thinking that by doing anything outside you're going inside and yet we read all the time the truth is inside not outside at all so how can any of these things help us the very reason why we have to get guidance from somebody outside is because we have no other place to look for inside except outside we are searching our inside by looking outside and that's where these perfect living masters come and they talk to us they guide us and they guide us to go really within ourselves and not outside but they are outside they are not real they can't be if if one if everything is unreal outside how can the masters be real they are equally unreal they are equally unreal as the outside world equally unreal as your own body equally unreal as everything that you are examining and looking at when you are in a physical body yet they are playing a role they are playing a role outside to bring you inside where nothing else brings you inside not even closing your eyes they come and tell us that it is not looking with the eyes that will take you inside it is looking with your awareness your consciousness which means differentiate between looking and being somewhere differentiate between looking at something or being somewhere now when you are somewhere that's not looking supposing you close your eyes and say where am i you are not looking you can say i am sitting on my chair here you can all say that you can close your eyes and say i am sitting on a chair here you don't have to look you feel you can feel that you are sitting on a chair 
that's it, a number of sensations are going into making you feel that you are sitting in a chair. Now, when we close our eyes and still try to look, then we are always outside. But supposing we don't look and feel, feel where we are, we can feel we are sitting somewhere with our eyes closed. Then we say, what's happening inside our head? What do we feel inside our head? Inside my head, I am trying to close my eyes, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to feel. Can you feel yourself sitting inside? Now there's one big gift given to us to make that happen. That gift is called imagination. Now we think imagination is imaginary. We dismiss it as secondary, something second class. It's not real, it's imaginary. We have always put imaginary, imagination in a different category, not to be taken seriously because reality is something else, it's imaginary. Okay, we'll determine that later with experience, whether it's so imaginary or not. But for the time being, let's examine what does the power of imagination do? <coughs> Can we, with the power of imagination, with our eyes closed, feel that we are sitting inside, not see? Can we feel we are sitting inside? With a little practice you will see, you can. What else can you do with the power of imagination? You can feel you are sitting inside and make the body as if it is around you. That you are sitting in the head of this body that the rest of the body is below you and you are on the top of it and that you are there, your imaginary self is not this body. Now, you, say, you might say when the body awareness is there, you'll say, I must be a small person. I must be small to sit, fit in a head. As you imagine yourself a small person in the head, but gradually you expand to the same size that this body is still inside. Then you can stand up and sit down without moving this body at all. Then you can start doing everything. What is that form of which you are conscious and is not this body? Have you just made up an imaginary self of yours? Or are you moving in something that's closer to the center within the body? The truth is that doing the simple exercise, an imaginative exercise, you are actually moving towards the center of the head in this physical body where the consciousness exists. If you have to discover your true self, which is consciousness, you have made a big step forward in going to the place where it exists. Otherwise, you were looking outside all the time. So being there is quite different from looking for something there. You can be there and look outside. You can be there and look outside and say, these are my eyes and I am going beyond the eyes. But this is not I saying that. It's you in a different form saying that. You can convert yourself from this form to that form at will in a very simple exercise. These perfectly living masters or any masters who teach you how to go with it can teach you very easily how to do that. How to position yourself as conscious beings, not as an outside image, but as yourself. Yourself who is moving, sitting, doing things and talking inside with thoughts. Do you know how thoughts come? The mouth doesn't work. Then we want to speak a mantra or chant something. These are holy words I want to chant. The mouth starts moving with it. But when you think, the mouth never moves. What's the difference? How can you be thinking in words and the tongue and the mouth has no role in it. And when you are trying to chant a mantra, your tongue starts moving along with your trying to make, move the mantra. What is it? Because the thought is with yourself. The tongue is only when you take physical reality to be real. So that is why when you can feel you are there, you are being there, feeling the being there and not saying I am seeing something there. The moment you start seeing there, you'll be out because you start seeing with these eyes. With eyes closed, you won't see anything. 
If you rub your eyes, you might see some things. People say, oh, I sit in meditation. I've been sitting for a few years. They come to me. They've been meditating, and I see some red lights, and I see some little... Sometimes I see some little stars coming, some small bright spots I see. I said, if I hit you on the head now, you'll see all these. <laughs> How can you call it a spiritual experience? I see some... I, I can see some red lines. I said, I push your eye from here, you'll see red lines. A physical experience we are calling spiritual. We are making a fool of ourselves. Spiritual experience will start when you can feel you are not the body, you are sitting inside the body in the head. And that does not take that long to experience. It's not one of the difficult phases of the spiritual path. It's an easy one. But once you achieve that, then you can start saying, I know how to meditate. Before that, I don't think people meditate. They waste their time. It's a waste of time to just sit and close your eyes, repeat words with your mouth and say, I am meditating. People have done 40, 50 years with nothing happening. And I know my, they are my friends. Therefore, if you want to do real meditation, real meditation only starts when you are not the body, when you are sitting inside your body, inside the head, and you can feel that you are there. When you can feel that you can turn around without turning the head, you can feel you can look up or down with your imaginative self inside. It's that imaginative self that can start meditation and not the physical body. If you hold that experience for as long as you can, what will happen? Supposing your whole attention is on that experience. Now I talked about imagination, now I bring you to another gift given to us. These are very big gifts given by the Creator. A gift given for us to go back to our true home whenever we want to, when we are fed up of this experience. These experiences were generated so we could have a little trip to these experiences, a little visit, and then go back home. And the way to go back home is inbuilt in us. And the way to go back home is to go back where the home lies, inside, right deep inside us, in consciousness. Consciousness will open up our true home and all other homes too on the way. So when we want to figure out how to meditate, we must meditate from there and not before that. The power of attention, that we can put attention on anything we like, is a very great gift. When you read a book, you are reading with attention. Your mind is not scattered. You bring your mind to focus on that book. You read line by line, you read word by word, makes sense to you, your mind is happy, and you paid attention to the book. But attention has a very great gift in it, a subtle power that you can concentrate it where you like, or scatter it if you like. You can sit in a place and just scatter, there's a crowd sitting here. Or you can start looking at that particular person, concentrate there. In archery, they used to teach in India how to concentrate on a target. When the concentration was complete, you could see nothing but the target. Supposing you go to a concert and many musical instruments are playing there in the concert, you say, I like the drums. Let me put my attention and concentrate on the drums. You would listen to the drums and concentrate. Drums will become louder, others will become feeble. If you keep on concentrating, you'll only hear the drums. What a great power. The power of concentrating your attention wherever you like, willfully, in your control. Not everything in this world is in your control. Not even your body. Your heart beats without your attention. Your lungs function without your attention. The blood and lymph in your body is moving all the time without your attention. The whole system is kept intact without your attention. Very little control you have, but where you have, it's wonderful. The, where you can put your attention and concentrate it. That's a great gift. Now, let us use this great gift to concentrating our attention on being inside, behind the eyes, in the middle of the head. What would happen? If we concentrate on being there, that means not think of anything outside except what is happening there. We can look around in the darkness around us. We can look around any lights that come up, anything else that happens. There's a very strange power 
within our closed eyes, that even with closed eyes, we can see some things. We can completely wrap up our head and completely make ourselves blind. We still see things. We can see things in the darkness. That power to see that darkness is generated by imagination itself. So if we are using imagination to be there, then the power to do things also comes from the same. And then on top of that, we concentrate on being there and think of nothing else except what is there. What will happen? He'll become unaware of things outside. It will take a little time or more time, depending upon how many attachments and pulls we have from outside. That's all that happens. When we try to put our attention inside, the mind is dragged outside by our attentions, by our attachments, by our attachment, desires. These things pull us out. If we gradually control that and put more and more of our attention there, any one of you can try it, you will become unaware of your body. Starting from being unaware of where your hands and feet are, then unaware of where your legs and arms are, then unaware of where your trunk is, unaware of the whole body. And you, that will become reality. And you'll find that what was being imagined there becomes real. And the body is not known. This process of withdrawal of awareness, withdrawal of consciousness from the body, is exactly like death of a human body. When people die, they die the same way. They die in their hands and feet, they die in their legs and extremities, then they die in the bottom of the torso, goes up. Patients who are dying terminally, I've seen them still talking when they're unaware of the rest of the body. Ultimately, when they die in the head, in the brain, dead, they are dead. We are doing the same process in a very different way. Just by using the power of attention and concentration of attention on an imaginary self of ours behind the eyes. And we made our body dead. This is called dying while living. They say the real secret of going within is dying while living. This is how you die while living. When you are able to do that, it opens up a whole new world. A whole new world based upon your awareness of that inner self. You will find that the laws of nature undergo a change. The laws of nature, which we think are so sacrosanct that we, in physics and empirical sciences, we think they're the reality. The laws of nature are the reality. They change in every form we change. Do the laws of nature operate when we are dreaming? While we are dreaming, we can be in one place, one second, second place, in one second we go to another place, looks normal. We can fly, we can jump, and nothing happens, normal. Those are not laws of nature of the physical universe. They're, those are laws of nature of a dream state. Similarly, there are different laws of nature of our imaginary self known to us when we are not aware of the body and that imaginary self becomes real and we call it the astral self. Now, there's no other astral self. If somebody tells you there is something else that is astral self, that is what you just made up by starting with imagination, becoming unaware of this self and this world and making opening up a new world, a new self. That's your astral self. Why we call it astral self? Because it does not follow the laws of the physical self. It does not follow laws of nature of the physical world. It follows its own laws. Its own law says it has no weight. You will notice very quickly when you do that experiment with yourself that that form of yours can fly. That form of yours can get out of the head as, as it were out of the head. It won't be getting out of the head. It will create a whole world within the head, within consciousness. It looks like you left the body behind you in a new world. These are things that they are still simple, what I am saying. I have not yet come to the difficult part. These are simple exercises by which we can discover our form discovers, our form creates the world we are in. When we dream, dream world is real. When we have physical wakefulness, the physical world is real. When we that form, that world will become real. It's a much more vast and exten extensive world than this world. You will have access to Memories you can't have access to here. We forget everything here. We forgot what we ate last week. There you can remember things that happened a thousand years ago. Certain things will happen when you are not aware of the physical body.
but aware of your own self in a different form that you can't experience here. As yet, we can do that while we are here. We start the process from here. How come we can do that from here, which is not real? Why can't we do it from there? Why can't we do it when we are dreaming? When we are dreaming, we can't do it. We can try. In fact, you can't even try. Have you ever noticed? In dreams, you can't try much. It doesn't work. In dreams, you can't try. In dreams, you can't decide. In dreams, you can't make up your mind. None of that is available in a dream. Dream runs rapidly from scene to scene, event to event. And if something bad is happening where you have to make a decision, you wake up. If a, if a great calamity is coming, just as the calamity comes, you wake up. If you're falling, going to hit on the ground, just before you hit, you wake up. Have you noticed this is a dream? Dream has a very special characteristic. It follows its own rules. This world follows its own rules. And when you are higher in that imaginative form of your, the astral form, different rules. And those rules make the ex entire experience totally different. Not only about who you are and how light you are, no weight problems, no diet problems, no transportation problems. You can fly where you like, you can go where you like, and you understand everybody around who's there you. Nobody can ha have secrets. Nobody can cheat on you. Different rules. I I'm just saying some of the things to make it an attractive place to try out. But what I'm saying is that going there at least will give you, if you stay long enough to be completely unaware of the body, it will give you an awareness that you've woken up to something for which the physical world was a dream. It's a wakefulness. It's getting awake. Now, I'm leading you to this point just to show that this is not a one-step progress towards our spiritual truth, our spiritual home. It's just one step. There are several steps. This is a step within our space and time. This is a step where you will find that all the heavens described in all our literature exist there. All the hells described exist there. All the origin of the universe described exist there. All the big bangs that occur which we are not able to explain exist there. All the galaxies undiscovered and discovered exist there. That the whole pattern of this universe that we are watching in the physical plane, the origin exists there. That itself is a great experience. For curious people, they spend a lot of time at that level. And you know, most of us are curious people. So we love to investigate all that. How can we see so much? How can we know so much? How can we remember so much? It's a great uh, experience, very great experience compared to physical experience, which is very limited. But that is just an experience, like this is just an experience created by consciousness. If we want to move further, now not everybody wants to move further. Most people want to go to heaven and sit there. And then what happens? They sit there till the time is up. Then they come again into different, another form. Up and down, up and down, sometimes there, sometimes here. Still in the same trap. No idea of what their truth is, who they are really. No idea what their true home is. To go to the true home, you have to go beyond that. Now, what is the method? When you have discovered yourself by placing your attention and concentrating it on the imaginary self and opened up that whole world, you concentrate your attention within that body again. The truth still lies inside that body, never outside. At no time in the spiritual journey will you ever find outside of the form you have taken. It will always be inside your form. And if you have no form, even then it will be inside you, where your consciousness is, where you think you are, even without form. It will never be outside. It's always inside. So when you are able to meditate with that inner body, you can become unaware of that body and open up a new one, which is indeed does not require sense perceptions, does not require seeing, touching, tasting, smelling, which are available to us in the physical world, available to us in the dreamland, it's available to us in the astral world, and they disappear because they are part of the astral body. In fact, do you know what the astral body is? If I were give, given you a real description of the astral body, 
it's our sense perceptions working on their own, period. There's no body. They, they are placed in the same place as this body. They function like that and they look like the astral body. The astral body are our sense perceptions. When you go to the next to the causal body, the causal body is also not a body. It's our mind. The mind functions as ourself. We have nothing around us, around consciousness, except our mind. And that mind is called the causal body. All things are being caused from there, including the entire creation of the astral and the physical and all of them. There is no place which is being created except from the causal plane. Even the great mystics, great enlightened people, some of the greatest enlightened people have called that as their true home because they have found that everything is being created from there. Anything ever created in time and space, ever, is being created from the causal plane. So they have thought that's the top of our possibility of realizing our own self. We are the mind. We are the universal mind. We are one mind. All the description given of a single creator applies there. Therefore, we say that is it. That the universal mind divides itself into individuated minds, gets into different forms of bodies, either astral or causal or physical. And we have all these different worlds being created. There is no way to go beyond that. So people, some of the brightest people on the path towards the self-discovery have stopped there. Because with our thinking, with our contemplation, with our mental seeking, with our desire to know, you can't go any further. And that's all we have to seek. How do we seek? We seek mentally. How do we pursue something with our struggle, with our mind, with our effort? And all effort, all struggle, all mental seeking stops there and you can't go any further. That's why so many enlightened souls stopped there and they were much higher than those who said our heavens are our end. Heavens were beautiful places, but they were not the origin of everything. So we could go beyond heaven into the causal universal mind and then stop there. And yet that was just the end of our mind, not our soul. Even this mystic did not realize that the soul is something totally different, that consciousness is not the mind, that the mind is an equipment used by consciousness. And therefore, the reality lay even beyond that. Very few people, even in what is called the Iron Age or Kali Yuga today, when the number of these masters is much larger because the number of seekers wanting to escape is much larger, the total number of such people who are beyond the mind can be counted on the fingers of our two hands. They're so rare. They're rare because nobody's seeking beyond that. The seekers themselves are rare. The seekers who are seeking something beyond the universal mind that creates everything, the universal creator of all the experiences, those seekers are themselves rare. But where the seekers are, there are perfect living masters who go beyond the imperfection of the mind and come from spiritual regions which are beyond the mind. The soul is not the mind. Consciousness is not the mind. Mind is an instrument, a cover, a costume to wear, to have experience of time and space, to go beyond time and space, to go beyond any describable experience. You have to use something else, no struggle, no effort, no method. These all fail. What else is left if neither struggle nor effort nor desire, nor all the conscious mental th seeking. is nothing going to take us up. And what will take us then? Now comes the real secret of spiritual truth. How you can go beyond this effortlessly, without struggle, without doing anything. If you do anything, you are stuck. Every time you do something, you are stuck. Now you have to go into a state of not doing, state relaxing and saying, I want to be there without doing anything, not without thinking even of going there. Is there any power, any method we know of which can do that? Only one. The power of love. The power of love 
is the only power that exists that can pull us beyond the mind. The power of love is spiritual. It's not mental. The mind cannot make up love. Spirit has love. Spirit is love. The ultimate creator is love. God ultimately is love. Love is that power which takes us beyond the mind. All other methods, efforts will fail when love will pull. Now, love will not push. Love will pull. Love, love never pushes. Ego pushes. Every time you want to push your love on someone, it's ego. But if you're pulled, it's love. You have to remember that you have to be pulled. So to go beyond the mind, the only way is to be pulled by love that comes from beyond the mind. Not love that's coming from within the mind. Love that comes from beyond the mind comes from such a person, such a being. And most likely, because we are talking in the human physical world, from a being who is human, like us. But the love should come not from the human being, it should come from beyond the mind. So a human being who, while he is here with us, talking to us, is operating with consciousness beyond the mind, his love will pull us beyond the mind. It's as simple as that. The perfect living masters who come into this world and are so rare, they do not come here to teach us anything. They come here to pull us with their love. And that love operates from beyond the mind. And that love touches us at the soul level, not at the mind. Mind can doubt and we can still be pulled. Mind can try to run away and we are still pulled. It's that kind of love that pulls us. Mind creates doubts about those very people who are pulling us. That pull which comes from there pulls us beyond the mind. It's love that is there, pure, unadulterated, no mixture with anything that is mental, physical, connected with senses. That love which comes from the spiritual regions and we can experience it here in the physical world pulls us up. Till then, of course, while we are going up to the stage of the causal plane or the universal mind and all these different levels of wakefulness, we can awake to these levels. Many masters can also help us. Those who seek to go to their true home beyond their mind, the master comes to pick them up and take them home. Can we find such a master? Impossible. Finding is always mental. When we want to find, we apply certain criteria. He could be a perfect living master. No, he doesn't look like one. <laughs> no, he doesn't behave like one. No, he doesn't meet my standard. <laughs> you are setting up a standard in a state in which you are all locked up here and applying that standard to judge who is pulling you from beyond the mind. How can you do it? How can any human being do it? How can any mind do it? It's impossible for the mind to evaluate, to know and judge that love that comes from there. Therefore, you cannot find a perfect living master, period. Whoever has tried to find a perfect living master has ended up not finding and then waiting and being found. <laughs> That's remarkable <laughs> that you have tried to find with the mind and run into different problems and different doubts and difficulties and suddenly because you are seeking is for beyond the mind. Because you are a seeker of the ultimate truth. That seeking has led to be found by a perfect living master. How can a perfect living master find somebody who is seeking? Because those who are seeking beyond the mind are marked and are different in their souls themselves. They are marked that the time has come for them. This show is enough for them. They don't want to stay anymore. It is a mess anymore. Therefore, they want to go to the true, true home and therefore they are marked to go to a true home and these perfect living masters can identify, know where those souls are. And therefore, they appear in a, in a drama, in a show that's being generated by consciousness, they can appear anywhere. But according to the laws of nature of a particular drama, say physical world, let's say, can a perfect living master appear in this physical world. And how will he appear if he knows somebody sitting somewhere is the seeker beyond the truth? 
he'll appear by the laws of this universe, by coincidence, by accident. S suddenly, accidentally, something happens, he comes to your life. What does he do? He touches you with love inside your soul. Nowhere else. You try to figure out what's going on with us. But he's doing his job, and when you want to understand what he's doing, you use your mind, he answers you with his mind. You ask a question with your tongue, he answers you with his tongue. You ask a question about this world, he answers about the world. He, you ask about meditation, he tells you about meditation. And he's doing it just for your sake, for the sake of your mind. He, that is not his purpose. That's not his aim. That's not what he's come here for. He's come to take you back home because you are a marked person and is seeking beyond the mind. Period. He will take you willy-nilly, whether you like it or not. <laughs> whether your mind accepts or not, your soul will accept it. He touches the soul of a person who's ready. And of course, he'll play the drama of the level of consciousness we are in. If he's in a physical world like a physical being, he'll be an ordinary physical person like us. He'll be totally ordinary. Sometimes might look more ordinary than ordinary. Why is that? He should look supernatural so we can easily identify him. He doesn't need to be identified. We are to be identified, not he. He has to identify us and take us home. Not that we have to identify him. But he, at some point we must know. This is what we're waiting for. The soul must know, consciousness must know, intuition must know, gut feeling must know, not thoughts. Our gut feeling must know, this is it. How does he make it known? By that unconditional love which comes from beyond the mind. That experience we don't normally have in this world. An experience of having love from a human being like ourselves, ordinary human being, where there is no condition at all where there is no expectation at all, where there is no such thing, you be good, I will love you, otherwise I not. Do this, other, otherwise I won't love you. No, I will love you no matter what. That kind of love. These perfect living masters are so unique in this particular aspect. If there is nothing else, I can tell you 10 other characteristics also of such people. But the most important characteristic, I would say, of a perfect living master who has come in a human form, appeared by coincidence in your life to take you back to your true home because you are a true seeker beyond the mind, the love that you will experience will be totally unconditional. He will love you if you love him. He will love you if you don't love him. He will love you if you hate him. He will love you if you kill him. His love will never change, no matter what you do. Now that experience in a human being itself looks rare, but you will experience it. That's a great guide to us to discover where we are in standing because this journey, spiritual journey, is actually the desire of all the souls, not one soul. All of us in this world desire that at some level. But the mind has overwhelmed us to such an extent that we have identified with the mind. We think the thinking self is our self. And whatever we are thinking is our own self-thinking, and that's all we want. So thinking self takes us outside to enjoy what was created outside, which is no, no problem. It was supposed to be like that. We were, we were here not to uh, sit inside and meditate. We were here to enjoy what we are seeing. We came here to enjoy, not to sit in meditation. Meditation only comes in when we are tired of this. We have had enough of it, and then we want to go back. That's the stage when meditation comes in. Not all the time. We should enjoy this world. So now we are tired, we want to go back home. It's like a carnival, like an amusement park. You go to, you spend the day there, you are not going to settle down there. You enjoy, go back home. We came to a much larger amusement park here. Sometimes amusing, sometimes it is not. And for a reason. The amusement increases when some part is not amusing. You know that these are pairs of, pairs of opposites. The law of pairs of opposites operates in all these three realms. 
the physical, the astral, and the causal. In the spiritual world, there is no such law because there is no space and time, there are no opposites. We have created a world of opposites to be an opposite to our unopposite world, non opposite world. So, this is a very beautifully set up. The totality of creation and the creator, which is the same thing, is amazing. And it's discoverable, experienceable when you are in human body. That's amazing. When a perfect living master appears in your life, he pulls you with his love beyond the mind and takes you to a realm which is purely spiritual. First time you discover you were a unit of consciousness, never separated from its totality. And that's what we call beyond the mind, par brahm, you reach there. So only one step ahead to your true home is you discover you were never even separated. It was an illusion. You were always totality. This is the spiritual journey that we learn about, hear about, can practice something for the mind and then be pulled by the love. Then we are open for that love when the soul becomes released from this struggle of the mind to keep us down, we go back to our true home. I am sharing these things with you because I was very fortunate to find the perfect living nest or rather he found me found me early in this physical life. I was able to devote most of my life. He initiated me as early as many of you are not born, 1936. Today, I have a number of years to look back upon. And from my own experience, I share these views with you, that those who are ready and are experiencing the desire to go beyond the mind to a true home will be taken to a true home and a perfect living master will touch you and your souls, you don't have to worry about it. I know I can say you don't worry about it. Every person I've told, don't worry, worries more. I don't know why. <laughs> it looks like the mind can't stop worrying, worrying about nothing, worrying about things that will never happen. So don't even worry about going to your true home. Leave worry here in this room. Go back home if you're true seekers, and you'll be very happy. We'll take a break for lunch, and I'll join you again in the afternoon.